Hello, and welcome to my talk about .NET 6 and Cloud Native. Welcome. Hopefully you clicked on the right video. Um, still trying to find a good way of doing the joke of hopefully you're in the right room in virtual conferences. That one was a little bit poor, but we'll see how it goes. So first off, thank you to the sponsors. Once again, this is a pretty great event. Thank you everybody for helping make it a reality. So first off, a little bit about me before we get into once again more of what we're going to talk about. I am a program manager lead on the .NET team where I work on a few um, few things, and the framework, ASP.NET Core, um, a whole bunch of stuff. But um, for the most part, for the relevance to this talk, my team works on ASP.NET Core, which is one of the most impactful parts we have for cloud native. And so, which brings me to the topic of this talk. So today we're going to talk about cloud native. And the first it's going to be in two parts. The first part, we're going to talk about what is cloud native? Why do I care? Why is, isn't this all just a big hype term that doesn't mean anything? We still have a lot of conversations around why should I even care about this thing? Or what does this nebulous term mean? Um, or is it just a phase that will go away? And so I want to talk a little bit about that. Then I want to go through and talk about the stuff that's been happening in .NET 6 that might impact you building a cloud native application in the future. Okay, so there's kind of two, two parts to the talk. So first off, let's jump right in then and talk about what is cloud native? Isn't it all just budge words that don't mean anything? How could it be such a big nebulous term actually be useful to me? And I want to talk a little bit about the history of this. So I've been, you know, on and off talking or thinking about working around how .NET could support cloud native for a while now. And when we first started to talk about it, it really kind of meant the opposite of lift and shift. I lift and shifting an application would be taking your thing as is you know, on a um, on a server running in, a, in your own data center, lifting it up, shifting it over to a cloud somewhere, putting it down, and having it run. And it turns out that in a lot of cases, without some amount of work at least, at least especially before containers, um, there was almost no way that was going to work for you. There was all sorts of things that would break. You would have, you know, your apps would work, would uh, write files to the C drive, which you couldn't do if you a lot of the like, you know, PASI type um, web application environments, for example, or they would make assumptions about all sorts of things that weren't true in the cloud. Some of those assumptions became, um, came out in the 12 factor guide. We started out of Heroku. Um, or now you see 12 factor or even beyond 12 factor where we talk about 12 factor plus a few things, right? And so there were just lots of things, at least 12, based on 12 factor, that were that people would assume about when building on-prem applications that weren't really true in the cloud because of things like your application moving from one piece of hardware to another in order to fail over or because upgrades were happening or something, right, for example. So you also then, if in that sort of kind of environment, had to embrace failure a lot more than you used to. Even though failure cases for things like network being unavailable or like them having intermittent glitches or transient faults, as we would say, like faults that just kind of go away on their own, always could have happened on-prem. It's a lot less common when you've just got machines that you've paid for with like direct network connections and everything is pretty good, right? They were always, they were, it was far more prevalent when you moved to the cloud, but there was a lot of benefits too. And then spas and things like that also started to come up because you know, see, when you pay for a server and you put it in a server room, then you've paid for it, it's sitting there, it's not gonna gain interest, you might as well use it. When you are paying for cloud CPU, on the other hand, it's expensive. You pay per usage, you pay for usage. As such, it suddenly made a lot of economical sense to move as much of your web compute as you could over to the client's browsers. People have got super computers in their pockets or in their laptops anyway. Let's use that. And as such, first of all, you can scale a lot better because you're not using a scarce big CPU on the server, you're using a very prevalent CPU on the client. It also was much more economically viable because those CPUs on the server were expensive versus the CPU of the, the client. And this, I say CPU, it's actually like CPU memory, like resources in general. 
right? And so it started out kind of meaning these things. And then somewhere along the way, it became this, right? How? Somewhere we turned into from that kind of how do I build an application most, most designed to take advantage of the cloud into there's a thousand different technologies with all sorts of strange names and they're talking about CI, CD and they're talking about all of these things that I didn't think of when I was thinking of what does it mean to run on the cloud or not run on the cloud, right? And that was part because of a few factors, right? And this cloud native roadmap, by the way, isn't isn't too bad if you if you look through it just in terms of giving you reasons for why to move. And the CNCF landscape is mostly really big because lots of people are trying to innovate in the space all at the same time. But it was there for dramatic effect to show you like there's now it's now seems like such a big overwhelming concept. And I get asked about this sort of stuff fairly regularly when talking to people who are fair, who are new on the journey or even early in as they start to research this stuff going, man, there's so much. Um, and so the way that I like to describe this is the reason we got to here is because of what people want to get out of cloud native. And that I think comes down to three kind of axes. You have resiliency and resilience and scalability. So this is utilizing the cloud, really, to be able to scale out, scale big, to be able to handle lots of load. And so then, which is something that the cloud is obviously super suited for, because there's so much resources there, far more than you could ever afford to put into your own data center, that you could scale out, you could burst out. If you've got spiky traffic, you could do all of these great, um, great things to be able to handle the dynamic load of your customer base um, as you need to. Right? And you can see you can scale out and you can be resilient because you can put things across multiple geographical regions. You can put them in different data centers in the same region. You can do all sorts of things to make sure your stuff is redundant, is going to stay up. Right. You can also, assuming you're doing the right architecture work to try and make sure those things are true as well. well then you also have efficiency, right? Architect for the cloud, design your app to actually be efficient. Right? You have code that doesn't run too super often. Well, then why is that thing sitting behind an HTTP API that has to run forever, spending resources forever, instead of being something more like a function which runs on demand? Right? That's not the only usage for functions, but it's the most obvious when talking about how different ways when you can, um, when you can get the most out of the cloud in terms of getting it, making it even cheaper to run your, your application and your code. Then this first one, third one, first one, third one is even more interesting for the context of this conversation. Because I think this third one, velocity, is actually how we got into this K place where we have so much stuff in the cloud native, under the cloud native banner. And that's velocity. So velocity at its core is how fast can I take this idea that somebody had and get it into the hands of my end customer. So how do I take idea to code as fast as possible? And this is super important, regardless of whether you're moving to the cloud or not, you actually always want to architect for this. How can I, your app fundamentally, all of your code fundamentally needs to be able to keep up with how fast the business justification for your code wants to innovate. If they are, trying to evolve the code fast, then you need to be able to add features fast. If they're trying to evolve it very slowly, maybe you don't need to add features very slowly. But more and more I talk to big, to large companies especially, about all companies in reality, but I guess basically in both ends of the spectrum, if you're very small or you're very big, this is super important. If you're in the middle, it's probably important, but maybe less, it seems to be what's happening. If you're a big enterprise, you've been you've become bogged down. Often you've become bogged down with features and legacy that is difficult or slow to move. And then the business is trying to keep up with these newer, faster competitors who are small and as such are turning ideas into code very quickly, and they can't because fundamentally their application is architected such that it takes a lot more effort or it takes a lot more, there's a lot more risk involved with making changes. So velocity. And so because of velocity being as part of this, you all then, that's why things like continuous delivery continuous and uh, continuous integration start to become critical. 
and they're very early in the cloud roadmap, in fact. Containers become um, containers and orchestrators and a lot of things around that actually have a lot of features and are believed to be like critical or maybe even um, mandatory for cloud native, depending upon who you talk to, because of these the features they have to try and help velocity. Like, like known recipes for how to do A-B deployments of a container, being able to roll back to a previous container because a container is always immutable and sits there exactly as is, so you know you can always roll back to one safely. Um, so it, as such, gives you more freedom to kind of bring in the next version. Uh, things like microservices are the big one because microservices, if you do them, you end up with, if you build structure your, your solution around my, the idea of microservices, you have many independent services, each one with its own data store that can theoretically evolve independently of each other because of within a well-known contract. So as long as you're not breaking the contract between the services, you can kind of just deploy whenever you want without changing anything else. And if you make those, and if those services are small enough, such that you can kind of keep them all in your head at the same time, then you can be relatively confident that this is not making a change within your own, own internal consistency and you can deploy. And that helps you then gain a lot faster velocity. Right. So if you're only talking about resiliency, scalability, and efficiency, cloud native probably wouldn't look like it does today because you also care about velocity. And because that is a critical part of why people want to, what people are doing today in modern apps, that is also part of this, I, I believe. And not everybody may agree, but I do. <laughs> Having talked to people about what they were hoping to get out of the cloud, out of microservices and cloud native, velocity is obviously critical. And if you look in, um, if you look, if you Google around for developer velocity, you will find a lot of research and such, just many of some of which coming out of Microsoft talking about developer velocity and how important it is for innovation. So now I've explained a little bit about this. Um, and also all of these things are actually also important all the time, regardless of when you're going to the cloud. They just become either more resilient, more important because of the nature of the cloud or because as you're moving to the cloud, your company is also trying to gain these benefits and as such, they kind of get coupled together. Um, but for all intents and purposes, one of the points I wanted to drop here was even if you're not moving to the cloud, to the cloud, to our cloud, even if you're on-prem, many of the techniques, technologies, and features that we're going to talk about are still going to be super important to you probably but you might not be in the cloud, in our cloud. Which is, means that cloud native is somewhat an unfortunate term in that case, but it is what it is. So, um, let's talk about this. If you want all these things, technology seems un seemingly unrelated to the cloud becomes critical, which is what we just said. Um, and so for this talk, when talking about cloud native and .NET, what I'm generally going to be talking about is just any features that, that seem interesting when building the types of applications that give you these three features. Things like microservices, containers, Kubernetes, observability, they're all kind of impacting onto this, this set, these things. And as such, these are the sorts of things that I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to show you every feature of .NET 6, and I'm and I'm and in when it comes to like the common underpinnings, there's probably even other things. It's just kind of a cherry picking, I guess, me running through the fields of features that are in .NET 6 and picking things that were that I thought were interesting along this topic. Okay, so let's with that, let's move on to what we want to talk about here. So this picture on the right is a sample architecture application for what we build called eShop on Containers. If you haven't seen it and you're interested, you can go look at it. There's a, a full book written and reviewed by a few people that talk about how to build micro, uh, cloud native apps and microservices with .NET. Uh, and they have a full reference application in a couple of different formats. The reason it's called eShop on Containers is because we wanted to be able to do shit eShop on X. And so we'll see how that plays out a little bit later. But so for now, what I'm using it for is as a ref, as a convenient way to point at the different pieces of a kind of big, of a reasonable, of a example microservices app and talk about features that impact those bits. So the, the, the application is a few web fronts, different types of web front ends going through an API gateway. Um, the API gateways are interesting because they, they kind of look like a single point of failure in an otherwise big, 
like a big like a mesh of microservices and they can be that uh, but they don't necessarily have to be monolithic uh, you'll see people like Netflix using um, GraphQL uh, Federation for their kind of API gateway evol evolution um, but they give you a, they give you a good they, they become super interesting particularly with mobile clients where you could make things like a single API in your API gateway that gives you all the data you need for one screen suppose so but but then doesn't but then doesn't uh decouples that what that screen needs from all the actual backend APIs so your backend services are pure your API gateway might have like more knowledge about what screens exist in your client app for example if you're going to do the BFF pattern which is backend for your front end and if there's a few other types of pattern that might exist but that's the API gateway um you notice um we have a reverse proxy that we've been working on called Yarp, which I don't talk about enough in this deck. I'm just realizing that you might be able to use for some of this. But that's uh, this an aside. Let's talk. Continue talking about the services. So then, uh, behind the API gateway, we have a set of services. There are some workers. There are some APIs. Each service owns its own data, and then there is kind of a backend kind of eventing plane. Like basically, this it, it uses a published pub sub as events basically such that one one right so that and what that does is rather than having you know the uh, order service or the rather than having the ordering service call some other service when an order is dropped when an order gets submitted it raises an event that then somebody else subscribes to so there's no direct coupling between any of these services which some people prefer some people do some people don't don't do that um, but this is a, we wanted to show that example in this app so that's the whole solution. Now, APIs. So in .NET 6, there's a few super interesting features around APIs. The big one is minimal hosting and map X for more concise services. So one of the things we see here in Cloud Native, as you can see here, is each of, and if, you could, if we have the slide at the very beginning where I had an example of how you might build this as a monolith, then each one of these little dotted lines is probably, you know, uh, each one of these databases is probably a single, there's probably one big data store. And each one of these dotted lines is kind of a module or it might be a class or a namespace or uh, something just to kind of organize code within one big app, within one big web app might be the way that you would build this today. The event bus would go away, they would probably use stuff in, you would use this in proc stuff to talk about it. And when building an app like that, which is the way we built apps for, you know, 20 years before now, and they can be great and they can be maintainable and they can scale. So they're not, there's not necessarily anything wrong with those monolithic applications. But when trying to gain the big advantages we talked about earlier with getting to the cloud, they tend to not be good enough. And as such, and that's partly because you don't have enough flexibility to scale. So what... Uh, we, uh, what we want to do here is when split the, those modules out... What that means is, is you've gone from, what that means is, is that you've gone from a big application with lots of modules within the app to many modules that are each individually much simpler. And as such, you are no longer using kind of code organization to manage complexity. You're now splitting code out across multiple processes. And as such, the complexity of each process is simpler and you manage complexity by via by, by fan out effectively. And what that means is, is that each individual one of these and historically is, is easier. And historically, ASP.NET Core is always trying to give you a good grounding to manage the complexity of your app. And all of that still exists for when your app gets complicated. But what we historically have not done very well is scale right down to when you've got something that is really simple, it feels really simple and the output is really simple, right? We've not done a very good job of scaling down enough. We've done a pretty good job of scaling up to be super when you are, how do have that complexity and we keep and we still obviously have that. But minimal hosting tries to give you the opposite. Uh, GRPC load balancing is a little bit, it seems like a smaller feature, but it's critical in terms of running GRPC inside a Kubernetes cluster. And so our GRPC implementations will start to get better and better in Kubernetes. Um, streaming JSON serialization, like our, we have system text JSONs, now faster, better, stronger. So when, you, you, when JSON is the language of all of these things, obviously you want the inbox JSON serialization to be really good, really fast, and have all the features that you want. And we're continuing to evolve that as we go. And then we have lots of work in a common slide, 
which you'll see uh, coming up when I get to common. All right. And so then, so then, and there's, there's a, other features happening in MVC and happening that might impact this. These are once again, 30 minutes ish for this talk, trying to hit the highlights and give you enough conceptual grounding so that you can see the feature list later on because it's easy to find feature lists, right? So don't expect this to be exhaustive. Now, this is an ex a quick example of minimal APIs. This is an entire program, right? So this is an API. It, you hit it with a HTTP request and it returns that string, hello world. It can sit inside a single file called program CS, probably a CS proj as well, sitting next to it, and then that's it. All right? So if I, uh, if I jump in here to Visual Studio, I can show you this here where this is this backend and front end app. I have this backend project. It has a single program CS. We I have a config file in here, but um, because I probably need it at some point. But um, this is the entire app, uh, an entire API, right? So it's going and go. It's it's um, listening on slash, returning some local IP information, and then I have this front end that calls it like with a normal HTTP request. Um, that's how simple you can push down your APIs. And in fact, this one is a little bit uh, too like complex. Um, some of the new C-sharp language features mean that I can actually get rid of this as well here. So as an example of how the language kind of impacts the structure of the frameworks here now because of language features being added, um, you can't quite do this in preview four that's just come out, but you'll be able to in uh, very soon in your own apps and your own code, you'll be able to do things like this, right? Um, but for now, if you're playing along at home, probably you'll need to run this. Uh, and then I could go run this, and it will run. But for the sake of uh, for the sake of time, I'll uh, just show you. Just wanted to show you how simple your uh, thing could get. So let's continue from where we left off. So workers, the if the, for those, I want to call this out because I think it seems to get missed. I think they probably get missed a little bit. We have this worker template in Visual Studio. We didn't do a lot of work on it this time because it's mostly good enough. It's designed for those kind of non-HTTP scenarios where you don't really have an endpoint, but you need to do work. So in the case of eShop on containers, they use it to listen to messages and process messages on the message queue, and that's it. I think they read off of a queue update databases, something along those lines. Um, so, uh, if you, we haven't done a lot of work out, but all the common stuff that we talk about, all, the, all that we were about to get to obviously impacts this and, um, get, uh, so the, the, and if you have been using worker, maybe you saw a like gold bar in visual studio that said, take our survey. I hope you did. Uh, if not, and you have been using worker and you want to talk about it and tell me, tell me things that we should be working on it. Let me know on Twitter or something. Um, we do. Ex I do expect to go and do work on Worker in upcoming releases, um, if not right now. So, client apps. Normally, cloud native apps. I don't in cloud native talks. I don't actually talk about client much, and I probably won't. I'm not going to talk about it in detail today. But if you want to talk about, but if you watch uh, any of Dan Ross talks, or if you, I'm sure there's going to be talks about Blazor and Maui and things like that, even if you just, even if you only go and watch Scott Hunter's overview talk at this conference, he will give you a good idea of all the things happening in the client space. Now, uh, the big things to think of, to talk about here is Maui with like cross-platform kind of rich applications and Blazor being able to do, you know, in browser.net. And that really fills, fills out the offerings of uh, .NET in order to be able to, if you want to, be .NET everywhere. So you can write .NET code that go, runs in the browser, runs on the back end, it runs everywhere, right? But also, if you want to do a JavaScript front end, that's cool too. Like if you JavaScript front end, .NET back end, that's great too. And there is some improvements coming in .NET 6 with our SPA templates and how we how we support JavaScript front ends in Visual Studio in that in our kind of templating process there. Part of a collaboration with people in the kind of TypeScript JavaScript team within DevDiv. Um, so lots of good stuff happening in that space. I'm not going to talk much about them because they're not really about they're they're, they're kind of once again <laughs> they're kind of common and they fit they fit all different app types. So specialist talks about each of those things. We're far better off, and there are some at this conference. You should go check them out. Uh, if at a minimum, I know Scott Hunter is going to be talking about these things in his overview talk. Also, the minimal API stuff that I'm going to talk about 
more in demos in a minute and also i just talked about go and see uh, maria nagaga's talk which will be happening as well at this conference so now is the big thing and this is where the dotnet the strength of dotnet really starts to shine this is something that i think perhaps we don't you know talk about enough which is the dotnet gets better because of the common underpinnings of dotnet because a .NET app is a .NET app, when we make improvements, they impact so much. So the common list is actually really big. I actually had I really had to hold myself back to try and get pick the like most impactful things here. So let's just go through the list for a minute. EF6 managed to be ridiculously fast this time around. So that if you're using if you're using EF Core, it is so so much faster to the point where you can use it with Link. And it is almost as fast as the Dapper ORM, which is Dapper is if doesn't which does a lot less, right? Because if you you write the you write kind of raw SQL, so in theory that Dapper Dapper should always be faster than EF because it is doing so much less. It is just taking SQL and creating objects for you. But EF is now so close. It is amazing how far how far they've come and how fast. And I, you know, it will not surprise me at all if Dapper now gets faster again because that is one of the advantages we found in chasing these perf benchmarks is that everything got faster for everybody. And that because as we did a bunch of work and we caught up to people who thought they should be faster than us, they did a bunch of work and then they got faster and then it's all great for it's mostly great for all of you all because everything gets faster. So check out tension power tech of power benchmarks as they as they keep coming, particularly uh, they created this new composite benchmark, which includes all of the um, all of the like your results across all of them, not just like this plain text benchmark or this JSON benchmarks. It kind of comp tries to compose all of Tech and Power to give you an overall number. And uh, ASP.NET is performing particularly well in that, and I'm very very happy with it. And so then IOPerf here, like writing a megabyte is now twice as fast, reading it four, is four times faster. So anything you're doing that involves IO or anything we're doing that involves IO is now going to be faster, which then has a big flow on effect. The reason these are important is because I said this earlier, but it's kind of thing is when you are writing a simple, small service, you expect it to be simple and small and you expect it to be fast because you're not using things to make bloat. So unfortunately, sometimes we have um, in the past a lot of our stacks, a lot of our stacks, especially in .NET Framework time, you paid for things regardless of when you're using them. And now more and more as we move into the core method, into the core like prem, uh, what philosophy, uh, .NET Core's philosophy of philosophy of only making you pay for what you've been using, that becomes less and less true. And as such, you can get faster and faster, which means your microservices feel micro, they feel fast, they feel good. And that's what we're trying to achieve here with a lot of, that's why these are kind of impactful to this overall end to end. Also, if your app is really fast, you use less CPU, you use less resources probably in order to satisfy a request, which means you're hopefully able to use less serve, less cloud, which saves you money. Right. Um, C sharp language features improve Lambda's global usings. We've seen that you saw some of those on how they simplified the app earlier. I'll show you some more of these in a minute, but the language has stepped up a lot in towards minimal APIs in particular is impacted heavily by being able to write code that feels simple. Constrained environments, and we talk a little bit, when taking your app, putting it in a container, putting it on a Kubernetes cluster, you're in a constrained environment and you tend to put resource constraints on it. So if you're trying to pack lots of containers onto a server, which is the sort of thing you might do, once again, trying to make sure you'd make as most efficient usage of the resources as you can, you tend to put memory constraints, CPU constraints on your containers. The thing, and um, because of the nature of the tech, we needed to do work and been doing work over several releases now to make sure we perform as good as we can when inside those constrained environments. Not all the decisions that were made when designing .NET Framework back in the day for big servers make sense when you're running in a small container with you know one CPU and 300 megabytes of RAM. Right? But if you're building a tiny API that doesn't really do much, then one CPU and 200 megabytes of RAM might seem like a really reasonable amount of memory and CPU to give it. Once again, if you're trying to build microservices, you feel like they should be micro, you feel like they should be able to run densely if you want all these features, and we're doing work. We've been making great strides there. The runtime team's been doing great work. Open telemetry, one of the problems with cloud native is sometimes it could be really hard to work out what went wrong. So things like distributed tracing become important where you can track a button click on the website to all the different API calls that happen on a back end, right? You can stitch all those logs together, for example, is one of the things that's really important. 
Open Telemetry is kind of an industry standard initiative around an industry-wide initiative around standardizing how all of those telemetry events should work, what the format and structure should be such that all the different tooling can understand that format. We support it out of the box and we were one of the first, we actually work very closely with Open Telemetry. So the way Open Telemetry works is in order to have their spec to be kind of considered 1.0, they need several implementations from different language stacks in order to be able to be considered 1.0. And we've done it as one of those first set that support open telemetry in the first phase of the open telemetry thing. Um, so then we have improved single file. Once again, when you build a simple app, it should feel easy, it should feel small and nice on the, on the thing, on, the, you know, on disk. So now you'll see smaller, faster, executables that you can double click and run on Windows or like invoke on uh, Linux or Mac, however you're going to do that. This is particularly impactful for your like Maui front ends, but it also is nice at least when you're building your small API and running it on a server. Um, logging source generators is super interesting. Um, it is effectively you'll get, you'll be able, should be able to compile time generate code in order to be able to make logging significantly faster, which is always super important because you want to do lots of logging, but you also don't want it to take a long time. So uh, container improvements, I'm going to quickly spin through this. Um, notice these pictures, this is, these pictures are from a Windows container. Notice up the top here, uh, this is from Richard Lander, he's ran this Windows container, said use three CPUs, but the .NET code is reporting that the processor count is 16, probably because he has 16 CPUs on the machine that he was running it on. You'll notice on the second picture, which is .NET 6, uh, this is uh, in this is in .NET 6 Preview 3. This one you can see, and then in .NET 6 Preview 4, you see, um, sorry, .NET 3, .NET 6 Preview 6. You see, um, you see three process accounts, right? Because him, him using like weird nightlies and stuff to make things to make things work back when he back when he made this work. So over, so eventually in .NET 6, in Windows containers, you'll see the process account will match the process account that was limited, which is great. It was already the case on Win Linux, except when it's not great. So .NET tunes itself a lot according to the value of process account. Um, uh, th things like Kestrel's I.O. threads, like the GC does things, like there's lots of stuff happening under the covers that you probably never think about normally on a day-to-day -day basis, which um, happen based upon process account. So there was a lot of detailed discussion. A lot of the threads are really good. If you want to go search, if you go to GitHub and search for some of the process account discussions, they, they are really good. If you're interested in how this works, look for things from Richard Lander. Look at the blog post from Richard Lander and Maoni, who works on the GC. Um, what, we, uh, will, what you'll be able to do in .NET 6 is there'll be an environment variable which will basically let you set process account to whatever you want. So if you know that you want to get those algorithms to, to use some, other, some value other than what the limit is going to being set on the container is, such that your orchestrator has a different view of the limits of the thing to what the running of the app does, then um, you can do that. And there are some scenarios where that's interesting and important. Um, I hope you don't generally, as we all hope, you don't have to do those things much, but if you're in that high scale, high throughputs, you might well want to do that. So lastly, I want to talk about Dapper. Uh, we have eShop on Dapper. So I said earlier, we have eShop on containers because we wanted to do eShop on X where it was eShop on a few different things. So the first one we built was eShop on containers, which shows you this containerized um, kind of microservice app. Now we also have eShop on Dapper, which also comes with its associated book, which talks about how everything was set up, which is the exact same code base, basically ported to Dapper and then running with um, running and providing the same app. So you see the same same example. So you can learn about eShop on containers, then you can learn about eShop on Dapper and you can take the same code base along so you learn about it. This is all within our reference architecture repos uh, on the .NET Ar in .NET architecture GitHub. I'm pointing over here at this screen for some reason. I'm not, it doesn't even make sense, but that's what I'm doing. Um, okay, so what is Dapper? Dapper is a set of building blocks, basically. Um, what it does is you run your process. It has a little sidecar that sits next to your process. 
you can talk to it, the little sidecar, and it does things on your behalf, right? So it could do things like store stuff in a storage thing for you in the, with their storage building block. It could go find another service and invoke it for you so it could pass a message along. It could take your little request and put it onto a message queue that then a different sidecar will pick up and then it will call you to tell you that the message has arrived. For example, it can do has some actor stuff and it stitches kind of observability into all of that. So for free-ish, you can kind of tell Dapper when I want to use, you know, open telemetry Zipkin or something and see the end-to-end -end metrics from all of those things. It has some access to secrets as well, which is nice, right? So these building blocks, which all can become real or all kind of interesting components of how you might what things that you might want to do in a cloud native application. And what's kind of nice is because it's a sidecar, it impacts your code a little bit because you might want to use Dapper client to actually talk to the Dapper thing. You don't always have to if you're doing like HTTP, for example. So that's not always the case, but it can impact your code a little bit. But because it's a sidecar, not lots, right? You don't tend to add lots of dependencies to your app. You tend to have those things spin up for you. Um, and you can take bits and pieces, right? If you're not using... If you're not using um, uh, PubSub and, and like events, like cloud events, then don't worry about it. They don't, they don't, it doesn't really cost you anything. Um, so that's nice. And so because, you know, it's been a while since I've shown you some code, let's switch to an example here. So this is using Visual Studio Code and it has, um, it's a solution with um, several several pieces. They're not, it's not super important, but um, it has a web app, which in this case I believe is a JavaScript felt application. It has a .NET Web API and a .NET Worker. And so what happens in here is the there's a button on the web app. You click it, that calls the API. The API just puts a message, tells Dapper to put a message on a message that I'm going to do PubSub on this topic. Dapper does its thing, and then eventually the worker gets called that a message happened, right? So what's interesting about this though, is that down here, let me zoom, let me zoom in and wah, let me uh, undo that, Vloop. sorry about that. Let me uh, look down here. So you see this .NET 6 Docker Dapper container, right? What's happening here is I actually have you'll note if you note look at my other dot my other app over here looks very different. I have very different extensions and then over here I don't. It's because I'm using a dev container. So my dev container has .NET 6 in it, and when I open um, this app and run it in the dev container, all the extensions and all the bits and pieces I need to run my app are all there. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up a terminal. I'm going to do tire run. And then um, what happens here is this spins up all of my app. And so you can see here, oh, my dashboard has started. Okay, okay cool. Well, let me, what does that look like? Let me open it up in a dashboard. And so then um, Ty is a tooling project. It's experimental. If you go search for it on .NET Ty, it basically takes the job of stitching together all the services and containers that my application might need, running them in one go, giving me all the logs in a central location, letting me click on the links and doing all that kind of local orchestration effectively. If you're building an app of multiple parts, it can be super useful for a dev perspective. Um, so you can see now it's spun up all these pieces and you can see here, right, my web app is not a Dapper thing. It's just a it's just a um, JavaScript app that I click a button on. My web API and my worker are so you can see Ty is taking care of running my Dapper bits for me. And you can see these are the sidecars. They sit next to my app. And then I have a web app. I have a web API. I have a worker, and I have a few other bits and pieces. And so if I go into my ingress here. So one of the things that Ty sets up for you is this ingress proxy, which can proxy through to different services if you want them. So hello, microservice world, I can invoke this service. And then if I come back here, I can probably see in my logs. Yeah, some, some stuff has happened over here. If I look in my web API, what do I see? Yeah, look, so as I click my button, I saw a publish, it published this message. Then if I go back and I look at my worker logs, I can see, yeah, I can now I've got a message saying received from topic A, right? Because my because my worker, and that and the 
so then and then there's also some kind of zip some zipkin and observability metric stuff that's been set up here so I can see stitch together all of those logs if I want to um, so for example uh, SEQ here which is a cool kind of uh, library from our community would let me um, view all of the logs and search across all of the logs that happened whilst I've been running and I can see everything, I can search for everything, and I, it's uh, structured logging as well. So you can search for things like where HTTP request is greater than 400 or something, and then it'll give me greater than or equal to 400, and then it'll give you 400s, 404s, 500s, for example, because it's because of structured logging. Okay, now if I look at some of the codes here, let's stop, stop it from running. If I look at some of the codes in my web API now, um, I have, I tell it to use the, I basically create a builder, I set up some cores because cores, and then um, I have a publish method. This is the thing, this is the API that the JavaScript app calls, and it gets the Dapper client, calls build, publishes an event, and says okay. Right. This is this gets and once again, as I said earlier, this will get a lot simpler in the in the upcoming versions. Like this cast will go away. Um, you probably won't you won't probably won't need to do this, or if you do do this, it'll look a little bit different, look a little bit better, um, things like that. But you notice single file, single program.cs, what like fifty something lines of code. You, the big thing here is usings, which hopefully a language feature will move. With, there's a feature called global usings, which will hopefully mean these will go away in the near, in the not so distant future, to make this even simpler. But once, but once again, it shows you that your simple microservice can be a simple microservice. And I would assert that whilst you could build microservices historically, they didn't feel micro when looking at them, even though we could kind of know that they were that they were fairly they were very simple. Um, so this is your pub your your the, the publish API then something that's interesting which I'll show you the worker is also a, actually a HTTP app one of the things that is interesting about Dapper is it kind of hides things behind HTTP or gRPC endpoints so even though when I put a published a message it went onto a message queue and then eventually it came back to here where the the Dapper sidecar sent the message as a HTTP request so this is doing PubSub, but you wouldn't know or care. And I could actually invoke this synchronously as a HTTP request or via a PubSub if I wanted to, right? I'm also free to, if I wanted to, some of the other things that are kind of interesting about this different model, if I want this to be a singleton, well, I can kind of move it there, right? I wouldn't do that obviously for this because it needs to be disposed as such. But like if Dapper client was, a, if I was going to have a single Dapper client for all my app, I can just kind of move it here and it'll do logically, right? And so the minimal API stuff and the way this hosting layer now works, what's, what it really does is let you use the language to organize your language, to organize your code as you want rather than being forced into the conventions of the framework, even when you don't need them. When you do need the conventions of the framework, they're there and they're super useful and their controllers are amazing for being able to organize lots of things inside of a single process and things like that. And, and if you love controllers, they all still exist and you use them as much as you want. But you can also mix and match, right? So I could add a controller to this app and I could have this publish endpoint be here and then also map a controller. And then I could have some controllers and some endpoints. If I wanted to do that, um, I could because that's just one framework, right? Where this is not, it's not a like an either or kind of proposition. More importantly, some of your services are probably complex and need controllers or even, um, or even do you just like the controller because of the, that domain? Um, others aren't and as such you don't. So it's, you're now free to pick the right tool for the right process, for the right project and free to structure and organize your code in a lot more ways than what you were before. You could just move this code to a method call right and it would be fine you can structure it how you want in order to be able to organize it for your own kind of views of maintainability which is nice and i believe that uh is beyond probably probably slightly beyond the amount of time that i had so thank you all for watching um i've and you should you should to hopefully it was good um Check out, watch the blog to find out more about all of this sort of stuff. Watch the .NET blog as you see our announcements come through. You'll see more and more feature lists. Check out our overview talk. 
given the constraints of the format and how long we want to talk now, I like I skimmed the surface of many deep and important topics to try and give you a feel for what's happening and give you some pictures of code. But there's lots going on. There's lots to learn. .NET 6 is going to be a very big and important release for everything, not just cloud native. Uh, I hope you're as excited about it as I am. Thanks for watching.